This is Castle One. Castle One. Race officer speaking. Speaking. Oh, 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 spea
comprehensive medical pack and, and uh, I, I got the instructions, sanitise the boat, put your gloves on. And, and it, of course it was the wrong side of the elbow, so I had a mirror strapped on my leg so I could see what I was doing. And um, I did two or three dry runs, couldn't afford to make a mistake. And, and it's, it's, it's just it's always in the mind, isn't it? The thought of doing it without anaesthetic wasn't very appetising. So I took a deep breath and just thought, well, we'll go for it. And it was a comedy sketch from then on because, of course, I, and I just hadn't thought of it. The moment I started the incision, it dripped all over the mirror. Um, and uh, I tell you, one reflection I have of that was how sharp a scalpel is. It's amazing. You should use it for doing the roast. Um, it just you just touch the skin and in it went but he'd said you've got to keep going there's a lot of fluid you have to release it and I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper and I just couldn't believe it. I thought I'd cut my arm off in a minute so I just kind of didn't this right I've gone enough I, I, I had the scalpel in my teeth to keep it sterile and a pad it's dripping all over the boat and I'm faxing the doctor dear doctor John Eve's not really going to plan and um, I'd been fine uh, you know, on the race, I'd had communications, but at that moment, the, it all broke down. So I faxed the race headquarters, please call Dr. Johnny, he's telling them that his fax machine has broken down and, and um, I obviously wasn't going to get an answer for a while and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't make a cup of tea, which would be my go-to. And um, um, it was a success in the end and got it sorted out. And we'd been quite careful um with the timing, I changed the drug regime every, I think it was five days, so that the the infection didn't build up a, a resistance. And we, we did it, uh, I think it was about a week before Cape Horn, um, because, um, you know, if septicemia set in, it, would, it was, could be pretty catastrophic. So if it went wrong, at least I could go into the Falklands. Um, and I had to do it early enough such that it would be pretty much healed before we got to the heat of the tropics where infection would be guaranteed. And, um, and I, I had a drain in it and, you know, felt happy to go beyond the Falklands. It was still pretty grim, um, uh, but, but it was fine. And, um, yeah... Oh, that makes me feel all funny listening to that. I mean, there has been some brilliant Vendée operations in the day, hasn't there? Yeah, you know, sewing yeah. tongues back on and yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Well, you just got to. You can't get off. You know, some people say, well, how did you do it? You think, well, you can't get off. So what? If, you don't really have any any other option. Um, and, and again, it's part of this great challenge it's 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 far more it's very funny you know when you're doing it you're just absolutely driven by the competition you know and the race results come in and you've gained a mile lost a mile and and you just that's an absolute driver and then you finish the race and I'm doing a talk in a club and the first question is well where did you come in the race and it kind of says a lot about the event I think is is actually Yes, it's a big driver, but finishing the race is far more than a than a competition. I think, possibly less so now, um, uh, but certainly back then it was it was um, it was it, uh, it was cool. Yeah. Well, you did finish the race. You arrived back into the Sabdalon after 126 rather eventful days at sea, fifth place in the Vendée Globe, and a race that only six boats finished. I mean, for the fleet, it had been a brutal lap. Capsizes, a dismasting, and sadly, the loss of a fellow skipper in the Southern Ocean. You know, how emotional was it when it was finally over? Um, well, it was just great. You know, I think that, if I'm honest, the greater, the greater sense of relief and perhaps achievement was getting round Cape Horn and then just breaking free of that necklace of, of depressions because it had been a pretty oppressive two months um, for the whole fleet. Uh, you know, as you say, 16 boats started, only six finished. I had the rescue, the operation and all sorts of other problems. And if once you've got round Cape Horn and you're heading up, you know you've pretty much nailed it unless you're very unlucky. So that that was... Uh, and And you kind of bit like an onion you, you you're starting as you go north you're peeling off your layers and layers of thermals and then you you know you're in your shorts and it's liberating it's just fantastic so 
that, that was a big moment. I mean, the finish was, was well, it was amazing. Um, yeah, describe it, the scenes. What, what sort of reception well, it was bizarre. did you have? Um, well, that was the funny thing, because I, I had pretty limited um, communications. I, I was completely unaware that it was... It had been such a big story, and um, and so I had no anticipation at all of 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 the finish. But thirty miles out, the first light aircraft appeared, and then fifteen miles out, there's helicopters, and five miles out, there's trawlers, and then there's this armada of boats, and. Um, and and actually, it became very embarrassing because you're not allowed outside assistance. There was this huge acres of boats, and I couldn't find the finish. <laughs> so I'm sailing around like an idiot amongst all these boats and trying to find the finish. And it was actually physically embarrassing. And, and, and I just caught, I remember two boats opened up and I could see the boy and it got a bearing on it. And I thought, oh, I've, I've actually finished now. And... Um, and then, I mean, it was just this crush of, of boats. So a load of the French are so organised of Zodiacs, you know, inflatable Zodiacs, just went all around the boat like this big rubber buffer. And, um, you, you know, friends came on. I said quickly hello to Tracy. She was still in a, in a, in a Zodiac. And then um, going up, up the entrance there were so many boats at one point there was a, a log jam just we all crunched to a stop and uh, um, oh it was bizarre really we came alongside and Raph and I had promised each other that he would take my lines when I finished and he did he was there which was brilliant um, family and Tracy and and um, uh, I met Virginie and um you know, you get that big bottle of champagne, which is rather fun. And uh, so it was kind of mad, really. I, I'd gone from complete isolation to I stepped off the boat, um, surrounded by big, beefy bodyguards. Literally, one boy was punched, pushing people off and taken through this mob um, up into a marquee. And then they have a separate room in the marquee for family time. So suddenly you're thrown in there and it's tea and cake. And it's just, just as funny mental. And then, so I can't remember, I had a short period there and they said, right, now can you come along? And I don't speak French, I have no idea. And I'm, I'm on a height, it's just great. Yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. And walked out this little door was a back door to a stage. And, and there's literally... Tens of thousands of people. And I had no anticipation at all. I didn't know this happened. And it was just boom and got interviewed. And a, and a very good friend, Lulu Troop, I don't know if you know her, she was there and she, she's fluent in French. So fortunately she was um, uh, translating for me and it was just brilliant. Yeah, it was really good. And you, you just get to recount your race. And then... Um, uh, we, we went to a bar, the Galway Bar, I think it was called, which was our go-to bar. That was the club bar. So he'd really looked after us at the start when we had no money and everything. And that was where we went. So for him, it was fantastic. And uh, we had a great night, stayed up all night and, uh, yeah, yeah, chatting with Tracy and um, eating strawberries. And it was, it was really cool, yeah. A real hero's welcome. But, I mean, after that, you received an MBE from the Queen, of course, but also you were awarded the Legion d'Honneur, presented by President Jacques Chirac. Raphael Donnelly was at the ceremony. How did you feel about all of that? Well, it was weird. It was funny. I mean, I didn't know. One of these little dits that came through on the limited communications, um, Mark, Mark Orr, who was... It was a huge supporter and he'd, he'd carried a big weight and he went on to become, we did a huge amount of work with Team Phillips. But he sent this message. He said, oh, Pete, the French are going to give you the Légion d'honneur. I had no idea what it was. I said, oh, yeah, what's that then? You know, he said, well, it's, it's a, a medal. I said, oh, well. So um, the Légion d'honneur is a really interesting medal. It was... Uh, um, Napoleon came up with it. Um, but you get it in, in the Elysee Palace in Napoleon's favourite room. And um, uh, Jacques Chirac was 
going to present it. I didn't think he would because there was a bigish political issue at the moment and Cole had flown into Paris to have this big meeting. Um, but he did. He did. He came out. He was fantastic. He was absolutely wonderful man there's lots of funny memories I nutted him because he went <laughs> I went to shake his hand and he went to kiss me and um, you know that classic fumbling English cultural thing and uh, my mum there was loads of press and my mum had one of those little cardboard you know those instamatic cameras and she said oh, could I take a picture I said oh Mr President you know, do you mind if my mother takes a picture? And he swept the national press aside and Madame Goss, so she took this picture. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to be really cheeky now. I said, Mr. President, can I take a picture of my mum with you? And, um, and, and it was wonderful. And there was other skippers there, you, you know. And um, it, it was an amazing thing, wonderful food. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was. You know, you do these projects, and like I said, they, they enable you to dive into things that you'd never, never anticipate. It's all through sailing, and uh, yeah, it was it was fantastic. It's yeah. very special. I mean, when you look at the Vendée now, Pete, what do you think? I mean, the race record is an incredible 74 days set by Amel yeah. Leclerc in the 2016 edition. The boats are foiling, yeah, they're sailing yeah. inside. You know, how does that compare to what, everything you went through well I mean it on the one hand it doesn't compare at all but 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 on the other hand that's what the Vendee is is about it's about innovation and technology and moving forward so perhaps the the vehicles are different but I, the challenge is is um is the same it's people giving their absolute uh, and um they they take less time but the intensity is higher uh, and so I mean, I love love watching. I'd love to sail on one of those boats. They just look fantastic, and um, and so it's really interesting. I mean, in my day, it was the swing keel and 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 the like. We had asymmetric dagger boards. That was that was a proving ground. And and when you look at now, the next chapter is is really going into these foils, and and it's I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, it's a big big event now commercially. It's huge huge budgets you know if you want to do a von d it's probably about a five million pound budget i think because obviously you've got to have a five-year campaign um but it, it, its essence is the same and you know people are putting everything on the line they all have those same aspirations at the start you don't know what's gonna happen to any of them and even you know, Escoffio, his boat sank, he was rescued. So it still has all the drama. And so I think for the race, it's nothing to do with sailing. It's a very human story in, in the sense that a non-sailor can just relate to it straight away. It's one person around the world, non-stop, with no outside assistance allowed. And, and that, that is just a hugely emotive thing, isn't it? Um, so, you know, the arms race and the technology is, is driven as much by the sponsorship as, as the skippers. They're still drawn to that, that, that urge to go and take on a big challenge and see if they measure up to it. Well, Pete, if we go back to the 90s and just before you'd even left the Sabdelon, leading French offshore sailor Bruno Perron had already announced what was simply called the race the first ever non-stop, no rules, no limits, around the world sailing event with a $2 million prize purse. It was pretty exciting. I mean, the sailing community was really excited by the prospect and it had already piqued your interest. I mean, was that in your mind during the Vendée or was it finish the Vendée, then move on? You know, how did all that come about? Well, um, I'm, I've always got... About ten projects in my mind. I mean, even now, all ideas and things. Just because your mind's a great thing, isn't it? You can think and and. Um, but I've always said, like I said to the um, all the British Steel Challenge crew, in, in a sort of pastoral duty, was to explain to them that you know, this is the biggest thing you you might have done in your life up till now, but it will come to an end, and you need to be. A, aware that there's an end and you don't want to drop off a precipice. So really think about that and you should finish the race 
with already in mind what you want to do next so that you walk away from the boat looking forward rather than back over your shoulder because it'll take much longer to get you know through that vacuum and and on things so I've I've always had there's been a natural progression to to what's next and the race was announced I mean it was manna from heaven it was brilliant you could what what a great concept so there were no limits bar the course so for the first time ever there wasn't a straight jacket and you could the opportunity was either to take known technology and make it bigger or grasp it by the horns and be audacious and so there was only one choice for us and and had a beer with um adrian thompson uh the week the start of the ostar before the vendee and we'd we'd sort of scoped out the way to go and had two catamarans as you know my greatest fame <laughs> one of my claims to fame is i lost the world's biggest catamaran which is a very sad end to a wonderful project but we had that concept and then we taken a known technology and make it bigger and then we did some numbers and we we the two competed and we decided that team philips would be would be worth a shot and and that was the whole point of the event i think was to really go out of the go out of the norms and it was just um yeah it was irresistible so a lot of time was spent on the vondi thinking about the new boat and being down there and visualizing it so on the british steel challenge i was visualizing the vondi on the vondi i was visualizing the next one yeah it was a big step though pete wasn't it in lots of ways you struggled to find the money for the vondi and this this was going to be next level i mean i'm guessing you had a, a bigger profile by then but how much belief did you have that you could make this happen um the yeah it's a it's a it's a funny one isn't it um i just like i said i don't have a career i have a series of daft ideas and that was the next daft idea and um and just uh went for it um um i i mean it's how you approach it so i actually made the commitment the night of the finish of the vondee so we knew what it was we'd done a lot of thinking about it and then trace and i made a commitment that night and the next morning really signed up mark or to to who became managing director of the project and uh we had the concept already in place so there was quite a lot in in my mind and um i mean i don't it's a funny thing i could have just gone on and done another vondee and another vondee and and uh that would have been perhaps a natural progression to go for a 60 footer and we could have done a really good campaign but um and there's nothing wrong with that but to me life's just so short and I never like repeating anything so I've done that sign that off let's try something else so all of the projects have been pretty different um yeah the the it was tough but I the way we approached it was um uh it was quite interesting we committed to do to put an entry in the race but the race didn't have any sponsorship So there was this huge vacuum of of aspiration and no nothing concrete. So what what we did was we went round to um four sponsors that we'd had a long-term relationship with and said, "Look, let's I'm just going to fly a kite and just put a bit of wind under a kite and let's see what happens." Um we had conceptual drawings, we we launched it at the boat show and and we we had a pyramid of sponsorship. So there was um bronze sponsors were 50,000 on the bottom the next level was two silver sponsors they got a mast and sails each so the boat has two masts and then you had the title sponsorship on the top so i went to them and said look sign up as a as a bronze sponsor it's only 50,000 pounds it's paid over 4 years and um we'll put your logos give them big presents on the conceptual boat and we'll fly this kite and by having your name on that concept it will give it credibility not just to us but also to the event itself so it really helped bruno get his event going and and i said if it doesn't fly don't worry about it we we still owned at kokor and we had another campaign for that and we'll just do it on that so for them it was it was just win win it was great they had at kokor and they had publicity they had all program 
around that sponsorship. Um, but yes, it was a big challenge. You know, we, we, we knew it would be about a four or five million pound sponsorship. We had a fixed start date that wasn't going to move. And so if you're in that situation, all it will ever conspire is to introduce compromise. And we, we always said from the outset that this would be a project of excellence. It would only ever happen once. And so we chased this very, very difficult um, uh, challenge, really. And, um, but used all the lessons I'd been alluding to earlier that had been learned over the years. And we, we had um, a visitor centre, which was free, in keeping with the ethos of the project. We had 1.2 million people came through that centre. So we kind of aspired to get a return for the sponsors before the start gun, because there's so many unknowns. We set up a company because you couldn't get the software then. It's amazing for, for the internet. We had 97 million hits, 76%, nine, yeah, 76% of which are outside the UK. We had a huge education program. So um, it was, we're just building up this great critical mass behind the project. Um, it was free at the visitor center, but for £25, you could net your name on the hull if you wanted. And we had, 10,000 names on the inside of the hole. And some parents, you know, it was quite emotional. They'd lost their child and they put their name on the hole and various things. And uh, so straight away, that's a quarter of a million pounds. And then um, the problem we had was it was a fixed price contract, but so many unknowns. And how do you address that? So we, we, we generated within the project a, a, a commercial entity through... We were designing, building, and doing various things. So we, we made about a million pounds, I think, which we put in. So we were quite big sponsors ourselves. It had you know, an amazing energy and momentum, as, as you say. But I, I want you to describe the boat that Adrian Thompson designed. I mean, what was his vis vision? Just describe for our listeners what he came up with. Well, um, it was a catamaran, and um, we looked to nature for inspiration and um, wanted something in harmony with nature. So you never see a fish with a flat top. So it had a lovely, you know, if you imagine each hull is like the shape of a fish, I suppose. Um, we, 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 she was very elegant. Um, there was no forward beam. Um, uh, there was two masts, one in either hull, no stays. So they were completely flex. If you, you visualize a, a, a windsurfer rig, um, because because there were no stays, the, the hull could rack, uh, which was, you know, flex up and down, um, which made it, you know, very sea kindly. The, the hulls were wave piercing technology, so we would just cut through the waves rather than trying to go over the top of them. Um, very, very simple. We only had a crew of six people, uh, and the accommodation was a 50-foot... Uh, accommodation uh, in between the hulls. Um, so when you're on the helm, your eye level was 27 feet above above the water level. So quite futuristic, very big. Put it in a car park, you could park 87 cars um, between the hulls, and um, loads of loads of unknowns. So um, um, it was interesting that the sort of like if ever you do something different or innovative, it, it, it would be. Um, very controversial. Um, there'll be loads of speculation, and that's great. You know, I don't mind that at all. And and they're in it, there should be speculation within the team itself if it's healthy. But we were prepared to try. And so, I've, I've always said it's an open project. Come in. You can have any any opinion that you like. Come and share. Give us the dignity of letting us explain what we're doing. But ultimately, we'll test it, and it'll either work or it won't. Um, and, and I still maintain that it, the concept worked. It did. It was amazing. The tragedy is only six of us actually got to see it working before we got caught in this pretty much freak storm and, and lost the boat. But it was, it's very interesting when you come up with something, perceptions uh, come through a lens from the past. So... You know, I'd done a lot of research, and Tracy Edwards, when she was doing the Jules Verne, I was very reading how they, they were getting amazing performances, but they'd go down a wave and slam that forward 
been and stopped dead and getting injuries and, and eventually they lost their mass and was just thinking, well, how, how can we, how can we, um, let's get rid of it. And the only reason you have a forward beam is to, to offer a forestay. So if you have unsupported masts in the hulls, you've, you've actually got rid of that. Um, and that structurally is a very complicated thing, having a beam out there. So it's cleaner, it's simpler. Um, then um, if, you, if you don't have stays, you've taken the compression out of the mast, which is in the middle of a beam which limits the width of the beam. Suddenly we've got rid of that, so the boat could be 20% wider, so it has much more um, uh, stability. And because it's wider, you can have your two masts, they don't affect each other. Um, with two masts, you can lower them, so your center of effort is lower. But again, these races are won by average speeds, and, and damage knocks you out of it. Well, if we had damage with one, we could still keep sailing well while with one while we're repairing the other and so there was lots of lot i could go on and on there's loads of elements to the to the design but but again you know you never see a, a seagull flying with with its wings pointing upwards and one of the interesting things about our mast is as they loaded up they would bend to windward so it was a really cool boat yeah it, it, <laughs> yeah I so much go. potential didn't it i mean i yeah. i I remember um, the amazing images when the boat finally left where you built it in, in Totnes. And not long after that, actually, I was at the naming ceremony in London, March the 14th, 2000. Yeah, and yeah. you managed to get the Queen involved. Her Majesty named the boat. I mean, that was pretty impressive. And I also remember sitting next to the actor Joanna Lumley at lunch, not known for her love of offshore, although she did tell me that she had named your Vendée boat. Yeah, I mean, it was lovely. It was just, just take yourself back there, Pete. It was a next level occasion for a sailing campaign. Um, and there was a massive amount of expectation, wasn't there? Well, one of the things we wanted to do with the project was to take it outside sailing. We wanted it to be outside sailing. So um, I kind of always feel that these are slightly selfish things in a way aren't they sail around the world single-handed so i've always tried to use the project as um as a fulcrum to lever back into into the community so and particularly with kids and, and we had a big education program across the whole curriculum but music was my favorite example and most of the schools in the country wrote a piece of music for the project we had three finalists and through my links with the Royal Marines the, the the band leader rewrote their their music into band format and then when the Queen named the boat we had the full Royal Marines band marching up and down playing the music written by the children and then again cheeky there was a company made records which were put in shops and then a radio station played them but the best thing was um, those little kids going on stage to shake hands with the Queen, I can shaking with nerves. And, and through sponsors, they were given £5,000 check to buy instruments. Yeah, it was a really cool project. It was, it was obviously, it was about sailing, but it was far more than that. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, it was really quite cool, really. Um, I mean, it was a monster. <laughs> it was, <laughs> Let's yeah. talk a bit about the monster. I mean, what was, what did you get out of the boat? You know, how did she compare to what you and Adrian were expecting to achieve? Number one, well, what she was, was like? she was fantastic. So, and again, we were behind. We got the boat on the water. There was no wind. Um, we towed it with ribs. We didn't have engines in it at the time. And uh, and then the wind came in, and we sailed over the top of the rib, and it just took off. It was unbelievable. We, we got twice the wind speed. We, we, it was just quite, not alarming, but this thing was just something, another level. And there was a number of funny things. Um, you know, you don't, you don't hear air conditioning in a building until it's turned off. And because we had no standing rigging, it was silent. It was just absolutely quiet. And the other thing was you had no mast and sails in and so it was like standing on a, a hotel balcony, you're right at 26 feet, deathly silent, just going off at 25 knots. It was unbelievable. 
And we got to London, um, it was about three in the morning, I think. I know it was, it was, we, we just made it. And Tracy and the kids were up in the hotel, went up, saw them and um, came back down and they'd locked it down. And I couldn't get back to the boat. <laughs> And I was saying to the police, you've got to let me in. I'm, I'm you know, I'm Pete Goss, I'm, I'm skipper of that. And he said, yeah, yeah, you're the third one today, bugger off, you know. And I, I, I couldn't get to the boat. <laughs> and I was exactly, I was completely exhausted. And fortunately, the Commandant General Royal Marines was walking past and saw me and, oh, hello, Pete, and that got me in. And it was just a blur. Uh, and the next thing I'm grabbed and I'm dragged up and put in front of this line of people. Because we'd only just got there, you know, we were trying to set up safety to get the Queen on, and this big car turns up and out steps the Queen. And I hadn't thought about it, and, and um, I didn't know what to say, and, and, and I always didn't know, I was meant to introduce the line of people, I had no idea who was there. And this is the Mayor, and someone whispers in your ear, and, and I mean, it's amazing, really. So we're walking down to the boat, and, and I just thought, well, I'm, she's a person, and just started chatting. She's absolutely a lovely lady. And then I realised she had followed the project because she knew details about the boat that you'd never get from a briefing. I didn't have to introduce her to the crew. She knew them all. Paul, how's your mum? Has she come from Australia? And, and um, she named the boat and then... Um, took her down below and she, she overstayed by a, a number of hours. Anyway, we got on like a house on fire. She is wonderful. Very special lady. Yeah. And well, I cried when she died. She was, she was just such an amazing person, really. So, you know, that was another just amazing experience. And, and um, um, yeah. Look, this isn't a soap opera. This is real. There's people here working 18 hours a day, seven days a week. They're doing their absolute best. So just back off a little bit. We were going down these waves, completely burying the boat. And, and a number of times we just, just thought, this is it. And yet she always came up again. It just seemed to me that there comes a moment in time uh, when you stop gambling with lives. And we'd reached it. On March the 29th, 2000, you were on a training run just off the Scilly Isles, and I'm sure it's a day you've never forgotten, Pete. Lead us through what happened. <laughs> it was a touch. I didn't know what date it was. Well, the bow broke off. Basically, it's pretty simple. <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, it's laughable, really, isn't it? So we had the naming, and it's easy to be good when you're on top. It's easy when you're up, up there, and, and uh, as we were with the Queen... And it was only weeks later, we're off the Scilly Islands and the bow broke off. It's not a good day, I can tell yeah. you. Not just a little bit and, of the bow. Uh, no, 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 the whole thing just broke off. And, um, uh, you know, we, we could go round and round the bazaars about the engineering and stuff. I mean, the materials we, we were supplied and the process failed. Um, but we knew then that the concept had something and and it, it, that was what kept us going. If, if she she was opening up these areas of unknown potential, and if she hadn't done that, we'd have chopped it up with a chainsaw and 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 buried it. So, but it was a very difficult day, and it was totally out of the blue, um, and it was incredibly public. Uh, I, I mean. Uh, we, we got the boat to the Scilly Islands and we've got the fire brigade and pumps and everything and there's helicopters, planes, satellite vans. And I remember walking up the pontoon to, I don't know, it was in hundreds of press and quite quite aggressive, quite negative and, and some of them. And, um, and I remember walking up and just thinking, well, what have we got, you know? And I thought, well, we, I know what we've got. We've got three things. First of all, we've got the same goal. The goal's not changed. Clearly, the route to it has. Um, we've got the same team. They haven't changed. This wonderful group of people. And, and honesty. And you're quite right. This is an absolute disaster. 
and you're quite correct, it shouldn't have happened. But the, the one thing won't, won't happen is this to generate into a finger-pointing, mud-slinging session. We'll quietly go to ground together, we'll work out what went wrong, and then we'll move forward from there. And that was a pretty simple principle that we used to, to, to get through this <clears throat> very difficult time. You had created it, this, you know, massive community. It was a huge, yeah, yeah. it was a huge yeah. story, and I have actually watched a few of those interviews. I mean, you were impressively composed and stoic, but I guess I wonder what it was really like inside. What were you really oh, thinking? Oh, pretty. No, no, I was pretty. You know, if you if you choose to. And, and this, I think, is a bit of a misconception. I mean, it was very emotional, and it was just the last thing that the team needed. I really felt for the team, and it was very, very unfair. But if you choose to, if you choose to um, work at that tough old case face of, of innovation and technology, it's a tough face, you know, and you get your knocks and things, and 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 so. Over my lifetime, I've had a lot of knocks and, and things. Nobody lost their life. We, we, you know, we believe that we could live and fight another day. And so it was very, I haven't seen any of the interviews, but it was, you, you, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it as it is. And I had a job to do and, and we'll, we'll focus on it. And, and it, you know, in a funny way for people following the project, it was great. It was another amazing chapter, you know. And I remember I, remember I wrote after a, a week, there was so many, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, every expert under the sun um, uh, came out. And, and I remember writing, I said, look, this isn't a soap opera. This is real. There's people here working 18 hours a day, seven days a week. They're doing their absolute best. So just back off a little bit. Give them a little bit of space. We, we will let you know when, when we know. Uh, and um, so, you know, that was quite interesting. But again, I, I really felt for all the people that were supporting it. And we had um, oh, tens of thousands of emails. So I had a postcard made and I wrote to every single person uh, a little note and a, a, a and a postcard for every sorry every letter that we had and it was emotional I remember there was tears and oh god I got back to the factory there was crowds of people in tears and cards and flowers and and um and it was difficult for the team you know um and uh, you know the, all, all we could do there was have had a daily briefing and people didn't know whether they would be paid. And, and, and um, um, But I, I always said, you know, if, if ever faced with a dilemma, just ask yourself what's in the best interest of boat speed. Because when we created the project, the one thing we did know is we didn't know how big it will be. And therefore, we must have a clear decision-making process. So whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you are, if faced with a dilemma, ask yourself what's in the best interest of boat speed. And that would be a kind of driving DNA within the organization. So a clearly big financial penalty. Well, we'll resolve it. Not quite sure how at the moment, but we will give us a bit of time. And um, But the measure of the team to me was while we were still trying to rescue the boat, they were up at Southam's District Council getting planning permission for our concrete boat. We had a 60 ton concrete block buried in the car park with bearings top and bottom because the mast didn't then care it's inanimate, it doesn't care whether it's in a boat or a car park. So we had load cells all over it. So for the months it took to repair the bow, the sailing team were up there at night in a watch system, training, training, learning, learning. So keep an eye on the goal and solutions can be had. Um, so yeah, it was a really interesting time of management and leadership and it started to run away from us. And... and uh, and I remember then I got the management team uh, into, we had a room in this factory with no windows, got them all in there, pulled the phones out of the wall, locked the door, turned the light on and just said, right, we're going to sort this out. Because we were starting to be overwhelmed by sponsors, press, public, everybody. 
and and just said, right, stop it. And 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 it was. I spent about two days, and people were clamouring at the door, so, you, know, you know, getting nothing. And um, when we came out, we owned it again. It was ours, and we got on with it. So it's quite interesting. The, the, these things are interesting in, in a um, in a human sense, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you learn it. You learn a lot when yeah. things are tough, aren't you? I mean, time, as always, as you say, was running away. The race was about to start New Year's Eve, two thousand, and yeah. you had a you got it. The, you got the boat back together, and you had a final training session early December. Saw so you head into the North Atlantic. I mean, set the scene for us, Pete. What was going on? Where were you, and, and what were the conditions like? Well. I think the first thing to say is I'd gone, we'd, we were repairing the boat, and, and that's another discussion about the structure, which is quite interesting. But um, obviously safety had been compromised. We hadn't had as much training as we'd hoped. So um, I, I went to London, had a meeting with the sponsors, and said, we'll sail the boat to Barcelona for the start. But if I have any doubts with regard to safety, we, we won't do it. And we had another program on the shelf, which they were very happy with. So, you know, we had a very supportive background when we set off. We weren't, it was, it was quite clear to them, you know, safety won't be compromised. And we set off, we went up the East Coast uh, and um, just really getting to know this boat. And it was doing everything that we hoped for it. And it was very, felt very safe. Um, the wave piercing was working and it was progressive. We just put her up through, you know, higher and higher hurdles. We got in a force eight off the Shetlands. She was amazing. Got to 30 knots, 28 knots off watch crew, didn't wake up. I mean, it was, it really was extraordinary. Um, so we then decided we were happy to head across the Atlantic and we went across past Iceland and we're about to turn left to go down to Barcelona. And we got caught in this phenomena, which is, uh, they call it a bomb. Um, and, it, you know, on a front, big front, sometimes it will propagate a depression. And this is your bomb. You can't really forecast it. And I remember Lee Bruce, the weather router. It was just weird things were going on. It wasn't following a pattern. And um, the air went green. It was very green. It was very strange. And this thing just wound up above us. And I remember saying to Lee, look, this, I don't understand, um, you know. And he said, I can't do anything for you. <laughs> that was in a thought. Oh, dear, another one of those moments. And um, anyway, we had these waves coming from all sorts of different directions. And the boat took a real pasting. And um, uh, the hull started to rack. And it focused around the uh, accommodation just in front of the helmsman. That started to break off. And, and so nursed her out through the bottom quadrant of this thing and then watched this wall of boiling energy sweep up, which was the main depression now sucked into a very severe storm and turned the boat round and just ran in front of this, this, um, this monster, dropped all the sails, and because we had no standing rigging, we had 30% less drag than any other boat. Um, we put everything out the back, chains, warps, at a sea anchor, and we, we were doing speeds of over 30 knots. And I remember, funnily enough, on the helm, and you know when you're walking around a city and then some, you see a, a carrier bag whirl up and blow, and I remember watching this white thing going, and I was thinking, Christ, what's a carrier bag doing here to, to realize it was the SAGCOM had ripped off and was being blown up. So we did everything because the crew um, put them in the starboard hole. We had a kind of safety chamber in there, locked them down. And, and Andy Hindley, I asked my second in command to stay on deck. And we gave ourselves probably a 50% chance of survival. And, and um, we were going down these waves, completely burying the boat. And, and the number of times we just just thought this is it. And yet she always came up again. And so I think it's thanks to that concept and team really that uh, I guess we got through it. Once we got through the worst of it, called everybody on deck, did a structural survey. Um, and 
I sat down. I'm very tired by now. I turned a chart upside down and wrote all my thoughts out um, just to bring clarity and um, made the decision to abandon Team Phillips. So it was my decision um, based on three factors, really. The first one was the accommodation had broken over 50% of the way around now. Would it keep going eventually cross steering? If that happened, it would be catastrophic. Um, the second thing, we'd been blown quite a long way north now, and we were on the top edge of the shipping lanes, which is your safety blanket. And then the forecast was another southerly gale in about probably a 20-hour period. I think it's so long ago now. And it just seemed to me that there comes a moment in time uh, when you stop gambling with lives, and we'd reached it. Andy Hindley recalls when you called Falmouth, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre, they knew you and the project and had been to visit the yes, team base. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and Andy yeah. says your, your demeanour on the call was, was actually quite extraordinary, like you were just calling them for a chat. Well, you've got to be professional, you know. I, I guess maybe that's... I, I don't know. You, you, um, um, panic's a killer, isn't it? And so you don't... Funnily enough, I remember calling him up when the bow broke off, and um, he wouldn't believe me <laughs> that I was joking. <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm really in trouble here. And uh, no, no, I do know them and f from all the stuff I've, I've done. Yeah, yeah, and um, it, yeah, it was, um, I think it was, I can't remember now, 10 hours later, the Host Express turned up, this great big German container ship and, and they were amazing. They went broadside to the conditions and this great big, I always remember like this, I don't know how high it was, 180 foot steel cliff was rolling backwards and forwards and um, um, we would crunch up against the hull and just crunch up 50 feet with sparks and paint coming off the side and, uh, and they dropped a little rope ladder down. <laughs> And I remember thinking, oh, God. And uh, and the problem was you had to grab the ladder at the top of the wave, but at the moment you reach that point, the, the boat would be literally in the blink of an eye, you'd, you'd have a gap of a swimming pool. So you had one chance. Uh, and if you got the ladder, um, you then had to struggle up that hull as quickly as you could because the team fillets would come crashing back in, but surging forwards with the mast slamming down the hull. So it was pretty heightened, really. If you made a mistake, that was it. You'd lost your life. There's nothing anyone could do. And, and I remember being on the helm watching each crew go up and there was spotlights and it was dark and rain and, and doing everything I could to try and control the boat. But it, it, I could limit it, but it was going to do what it wanted. And the worst one was Graham. I, I watched his feet go over the rail. He was about... A, an arm's length from the mast. So it was a pretty high, and I think it took about an hour. And um, eventually it was my turn and um, rolled over the railing and went up to the captain. Bizarre. Got in a lift and, <laughs> and, and went up 11 floors uh, and came out on the bridge and shook the captain by the hand and thanked him. And we stood on the side of the ship and he put his engines ahead and we just watched this wonderful, beautiful, elegant creature, which had just saved our lives and we put so much into it. You know, that there were millions in that boat and so it embodied all of that. And it was very sad. It wasn't inanimate. We all cried for it as it just disappeared. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. It was tough, wasn't it? It wasn't just the end of the boat, but the whole project. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, again, I wasn't... I wasn't um, funny, I don't know why you're bringing all these emotions out. It was, it was very emotional losing that, um, that boat and, and really what it represented... But again, on the other side, I was quite pragmatic in that, you know, th these things happened and no lives had been lost and, and it, the team just didn't deserve that ending. And again, I could, I could go into the structural issues and various things. It was, it was very sad. 
Um, but that was part of the journey that we, we chose. And I, and I think if you choose to drive in the fast lane, then you've got to accept the consequences at the beginning. And sometimes you've got to take it on the chin. And if you do, then all you can do is take it with as much dignity as you can and learn the lessons that you've learned and pick them up and put them to good use in the future. So, yeah, yeah, it was, it was very sad because she, she'd have been... A really amazing entry in the the race and what it represented. But um, yeah, so ours wasn't to be. <laughs> I mean, looking back at some of the headlines now, they were fairly brutal. I mean, as a BBC headline read, you know, cursed Team Phillips. But at the time, as you say, you were trying to push boundaries. How unfair do you think that that criticism was? Well, I don't, I never really minded it, you know, like I said, you know, you can come into the project, it's open. I mean, it's quite interesting across the race fleet, loads of other bows broke off in disaster, but they all kept it quiet. But I, I chose that the project would wear its heart on its sleeve. You can come and be a part of this. You can come and share it. And and that was that was our, our ethos. And, um, you know, you, you, you can get a, a, a cheap headline I mean they're they're doing their job but but you know if you came to the heart of it you'd very quickly see that that's not what the project was about or was like uh, or or, and so you you know it's 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 part of it and I gave all the interviews and explained it and and then after that um, stopped because you know it had come to an end and uh, explained everything and 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 so it had ended for me, and then you pick yourself up. I mean, it wasn't easy, but but these things happen, you know. Gosh, a lot of people put up with worse, don't they? Over twenty years ago now, when you look back at the project, Pete, you know what? Just what? It's over twenty years ago now. When you look back at the project, Pete, what decisions might you have made differently with Team Phillips? I, I don't think there's, um, well, I mean, you could say, well, maybe we should have just built a trimaran and, and a simple one and, and gone and done the race. But, you know, I, that's just not in, wouldn't have been in, in our nature and in the DNA of, of the event itself. You know, it was wacky races and we grabbed it by the horns. So I guess that would be the fundamental one. And if I had my time again, I'd still do what we did. And I don't see the project, you know, I I'm see the overarching, the big helicopter picture. And I'm very, very proud of Team Phillips. And it was a brilliant project. It made a huge difference to many, many people. And uh, it was great to be a part of that team, you know. Um, there's, there's always little decisions, but I think in the round, uh, I'd, I'd do much the same again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was just... I was on this thing, and uh, yeah. Pete, we've been chatting for a while, haven't we? But you've done such a lot, and we've only explored, I guess, the big high-profile projects. I mean, you've not stopped pushing yourself in fabulous adventures, have you? Kayaking around Tasmania, walking to the North Pole. But I wanted to quickly pick up on one, the spirit of mystery completely different project. Tell us a little bit about that and so different to what you've done before. Well, yeah, you say pushing myself. I I wouldn't say I've been enjoying myself. You you know, I I just do these things because I I really enjoy them. Funny, I remember listening to an interview of a guy going to do the Around Alone and and he was saying how he was having hypnotherapy because of his fear of death. And I was thinking, bloody hell, if that's how I felt, I wouldn't do it, you know, (laughs) So I love it. Um, well, the spirit of mystery um, started in a pub, and I heard about this um, this tale, this myth of, of um, seven Cornishmen who sailed a thirty-seven foot lugger from Newlyn to Melbourne in search of the gold rush, and and it just captured my imagination and. Um, but like all these things, I thought, well, 80% of it will be a myth and there'll be a kernel of truth. And maybe when I f- hang up my sailing boots, I'll do some research on it. 
Um, but through a quirk of circumstances, I, I met one of the original relatives, a lady called Diana Berry, and um, I started to find that actually this story really was quite true and got drawn into it and fell in love with it. Fell in love with the, the challenge, the romance, the history. I'd never had anything to do with, with history before, so that was another window. And um, it, it's, it's a Cornish story, and because I, I live in Cornwall. And Cornwall has a, um, a, a history of, of feast or famine, a bit like Ireland. And during periods of famine, the Cornish have been forced abroad. So the, we have a saying that um, if you go to the bottom of a hole anywhere in the world, you'll find a Cornishman, and it's true. Anyway, in the 1850s, they're having one of these, these troughs, very difficult time. And the seven Cornishmen in a pub, it's still there, the Star Inn in Newlyn, uh, trying to decide what to do during these, these dark times. And um, someone had written back from Australia to say the gold rush was worth a shot. And they decided that this would be the light at the end of their tunnel. And two of them were shareholders in this fishing lugger called the Mystery. And one said, let's sell the Mystery to pay for the passage. And the other one Captain Richard Nichols, who I always like to think had a few beers under his belt, said, no, 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 we'll go in the mystery and I'll navigate. Got round the pub, they became committed, got round the village, so they dragged it up the beach, they put a zinc bottom on it, decked it over, and on the 18th of November, 1854, they set sail for Australia in a 37-foot fishing lugger. And one of the other elements that drew me to it was the sailing significance, which most people know of Joshua Slocum. And he's often held up as the forefather of small boat ocean sailing as we know it today. Well, he was 10 years old when these Cornishmen set sail. So really significant. Um, why didn't it work out? By the time they got there, the light had gone out at the end of the tunnel and only two of them remained. The rest came back. We know that from a, a, a census. And, um, and I, I just couldn't believe it had been lost in the mists of time. So I thought, well, well, we'd do something about it and did a load of research that was interesting to get the design and um, put the word out and went round the local woods looking for fallen oak trees to make the frames to build the boat. And we built the boat and um, uh, we, we did their trip and it was an epic. We, we, um, it became a family project. Uh, I remember Elliot, my youngest, who was 14 at the time, we were having a family meal and I would say, Elliot, do you, do you, would you fancy going to Australia? And I'll never forget, he looked up, he said, well, Dad, I've got nothing else on. <laughs> so I, I kind of had the first member of the team and, and then um, Tracy's brother came round for a meal with his wife, Mark, who's a, a policeman, never sailed really. And, and I was telling him, just out of interest, I've got another daft idea, and he lit up like a Christmas tree. So I had the next member, and, and that kind of set the family rot in. So I emailed my brothers, and my youngest brother, Andy, just leapt at it. And so we had our team. And it was really interesting, you know. Uh, and it was an epic. I mean, we got rolled upside down, and Mark's leg was broken in the Southern Ocean. All sorts of things went on. But we did it, and... Um, Funny, we got to the finish, it took about five months, and um, uh, felt very vulnerable at times in the Southern Ocean, because with a modern boat, you can, you know where the weather's coming and you can best place yourself. Well, when you're in a 37 foot fishing lugger, it's a bit like a, a hedgehog crossing a motorway. All you can do is shut your eyes and we'd have a big depression about every five days, because we were so slow and static. And, um, um, yeah, anyway, we got to the finish, went up the gangplank, and we were met by relatives of the original crew and a pint and a pasty. And, 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 and that was really interesting. And um, of the two that remained, Lewis Lewis uh, was a shepherd. He died and was in a pauper's grave. And one of the Kalinak brothers became um, the surveyor for Melbourne. And um, his last in line, this lovely old boy, I don't know, he must have been in his 80s, 90s, came down and just loved the boat. And, and um, when he left, he gave me the compass that had come out originally with the original crew and was used to lay the streets of Melbourne as, as we know them today. 
And that was the interesting thing about the history. When they got to, 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 to Mel, I've got a lovely picture of Spirit of Mystery and this big metropolis in, in the background. Two lifetimes ago, that original boat turned up. It was Swampland, and they, they used to go um, into Simon's, not Simon's Town. Oh, gosh, I've forgotten it. On Port Phillip, it'll come to me. And they'd, they'd if they were well off, they would buy a shovel and a, a, a wheelbarrow. Often they'd hire it, and they'd walk up for two months inland to start digging for their future. I mean, it's amazing people. And it's two, two lifetimes ago. So it puts a bit of context on, in progress. I feel like I'm rambling wow, now. Wow, that's filmic, it was, isn't it? What a tale. It's, um, yeah, what yeah. What a tale. Yeah, yeah. It was a great project. Oh, I can tell. That sounds fantastic. Now, Pete, as we sit here, the old team class are blasting around the world in record time, uh, a result of the constant evolution of the sport, of technology, of mm. systems. Mm. It, in a race not miles away from Bruno Perron's initial concept 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Where do you think offshore sailing sits now? What are your thoughts on where the sport has got to? Well, it's cool, isn't it? I mean, it's great. You know, there's fun, more funding and, and technology and materials. It's just moved on. It's another... It's, and it should progress, you know. It should move on. And, and it's great to see all the youngsters grabbing it and going for it. And um, I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it's very exciting to see. You can't help but be drawn into it. You know, the America's Cup boats, you watch them sort of like a rally car sliding round a buoy at, you know, whatever they're doing, 40 knots and so on. And then the foiling um, Von D boats, that's very exciting. And these old teams are great. Yeah. What do you think it would be like charging around the planet, averaging over 20 knots? I think it would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'd do it tomorrow. Yeah. And wrapping up, Pete, I wonder, is there anything that you didn't do, anything you didn't try that you thought maybe you'd have wanted to over the years? Um, well, well, in terms of sailing, in say, yeah, I'd like to do the mini transat. Mm. I've, I love sailing little boats, and uh, I've, I've always fancied doing the mini transat. Um, and then um, I'd like to do the Sydney Hobart, uh, which Tracy and I were going to do in our aluminium boat, but that never worked out. But that would be a cool thing to do. But now I enjoy, I really enjoy cruising. And I, and I always said, I've, I've basically we've been, been very lucky. I've ticked off what I'd like to do. But I always said when I stop racing, I'd like to go around the world or, or go slowly and because it's such a shame when you're racing, you rush past all these wonderful things. So we're sea gypsies now, and we've just designed and built a boat to go and explore Europe's coast, upper reaches, rivers and canals. And um, we'll sail down the Tamar, and whichever way the wind is blowing, that's the way we'll go. And measure our trips in months rather than weeks. So once we've finished, it's ironic, isn't it? Once we've built the house, the first thing we want to do is bugger off sailing. But um, we've got a lovely little boat called Oddity, which is an oddity, and it's designed to do um, this gunk holing. And uh, she's 32 foot, but she's got watertight bulkheads and dagger boards, and um, we, can, we want to go up above the Arctic Circle. But in the morning, we can autonomously drop the mast, and we can be going through a canal under a medieval bridge. So um, we, the world's our oyster in, in that sense. So it's very exciting. It yeah. sounds fantastic. Pete Goss, it has been an absolute honour. Thank you so much for your time. And Thanks of course so. your memories. Thank you. Pleasure. Apologies for getting so emotional. I don't know why, but there we go. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, like me, you'll agree no apology is necessary. It's been fascinating to listen to Pete look back on just some of his adventures at sea. So I have to say a massive, massive thank you to Pete for his time. It was great to go and see him. 
I do have to say a quick thanks to photographer Mark Lloyd and to fellow photographer Rick Tomlinson for sending us some photos of Pete to help promote the podcast. As always, a big, big thanks for sending them. It's really appreciated. So that's it for this month. Until next time, if you've enjoyed what you hear, do buy us a coffee or two. It's super easy. Head over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash sailing podcast and do your bit to help us bring you these uninterrupted ad free chats with the biggest names in our sport. Before we go, the usual thanks to Tim at Vertical Films, whose hard work and dedication makes these podcasts happen. Tim, a massive thanks as ever. Keep in touch via social media. I'm Shirley Sale on Instagram and Twitter and Shirley Robertson on Facebook. And let us know where you listen. Well, that's all from us for this month. Thank you so much for listening. Have fun on the water and sail safe, everyone. Standing by. Out.